So this is module two. Word, I hope everybody has word up. I want you to walk through this step by step. Um, this is module two, specifically creating accessible documents. We're using Word as the authoring tool for demonstration, okay? You can literally take this whole group piece by piece, follow it through using a different editor, using a different authoring tool. How many of you create in D2L using the HTML WYSIWYG in D2L? If you do, you could literally have this open in one window and then have your editor in the other window and you aren't doing Word, you're doing the WYSIWYG. And you can follow each step and apply it to the WYSIWYG as well. Because what is Word? It's another what you see is what you get. It's an, it's an editor. So the reason why we're using Word as an editor is specifically number one, it's still the most used editor no matter where you author. There are some web developers that never use Word again because they're doing everything online, literally. Very few. I think I only personally know of one. <laughs> All the rest of them, somewhere along the line, they wind up using some sort of text editor like Word, okay? The point with this is, is the skills you're gonna learn right here are all going to meet Web Content Accessibility Guideline 2.0 A and AA. They're all going to meet that. You're going to, after you create this accessible document, you will know how to create an accessible document. And you're gonna learn that actually it isn't as difficult as one might think it is. There are a couple of difficult components and we'll talk about those. But specifically, the rest of it is a very straightforward process and it's actually very easy to use. Now, I will ask that after you go through the process, so please follow through, to use this with every Word document that you create from here on out. And then pass it on to your colleagues. The links to this course that you will get this afternoon is available to everybody. We want everybody to get access to this so they can follow through the same process and literally all you have to do is follow this step by step. So let me see if I can find Word. And well, first if I can find my mouse. Good, you have, you have 2013 on those machines too? Excellent. Yeah, we're I'm beta testing that right now. There's some good, and supposedly it's gonna harmonize between Mac and Windows. So go ahead and open a blank document. There we go. Now what I'm gonna do, first let's talk about document structure. Okay, so what was the first thing that you learned in English composition when you had to write your first paper? What was that thing that you had to do? Besides, I define what it is you're gonna write about. Do you remember? Outline. Yes. First thing we were told, we have to create an outline. How many of you in here are stream of consciousness writers? Yeah. Believe me, it was not easy for me to get used to that outline idea because I just knew what the idea was and then I wrote to it and then I had to figure out how I was gonna apply it to the outline afterwards. I still wound up with an outline, but it still took me a little while to get there. So initially that was kind of difficult, but I finally got it. But the point being is an outline is essential because it provides structure. And it provides concise structure and identifiable structure. When we read a document, we read from what? The top left down to the bottom right. That is our tradition. Line by line, unless it has columns of some form or fashion. So what we wanna do is make sure that number one, we're using an outline for structure. Also, we talked about conciseness earlier. We just had a really good demonstration of what it means not to write concisely and clearly. 
So we want to make sure that we are concise and clear in the presentation of our material. Now what another good thing about outlines is it helps us to chunk our material. Do we, anybody familiar with chunking? Yeah, you're a web guy, right? Or you teach, yeah. And that's one of the main tenets of good chunks. The point being is you put pieces in digestible, manageable pieces. You actually come to it and it's gonna help everybody, not just that middle group of cognitive disabilities, not the other groups as far as managing the structure, but really understanding concise, clear language in chunks that are manageable. It's easier for learning the material that way and allows people to navigate the material as well in a very efficient fashion. It's not confusing. Now, I will say this, that process is discipline specific. How chunked can we actually make Nietzsche? So, if you're in a discipline that, you know, the chunks are going to be much larger than, let's say, a different discipline like journalism, which talks about chunking in the reverse triangle, the point being is we want to make sure that what we do is discipline specific but still manageable, easy to identify. So the first thing that we're going to do here is we're going to talk about headings. Now, how many of you, before we go there, how many of you use the headings on the ribbon? So some of you do. That's awesome. Well, you can change the way they look. <laughs> That's the nice thing about it. So the first thing we're going to do, I'll go back a second. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to cheat, and I'm going to copy, and I'm going to paste. I want you guys to replicate this heading structure because we're going to be using it throughout the rest of this. Now, you want to make sure you have headings, and I'll show you how to do this in Word. We also have instructions in the course if you're using Mac. So if you're a Mac user, this will also tell you how to do this in a Mac. Word instance, I should say. Okay. So headings, basically, you want to make sure that you have headings for various reasons. It's easy to identify the material in those chunks. It's easy to navigate if I am a student using an assistive technology. It allows me to better navigate the environment. Visually, it's easier for us to navigate, and it's easier if I have a cognitive disability to better identify the chunks and the pieces. What's also nice about this is if you do have a fairly large document, go through and use your headings, and then you can go up and insert an insertion point and then use the table of contents tool and it'll automatically create a table of contents for you under those headings. So there's all sorts of really good reasons why to do this. Now, all you have to do, if you've replicated this, I'm gonna select the main heading, the main idea, and I'm gonna apply the first heading in the ribbon. Then I'm going to go ahead and apply the second heading using the ribbon. I'm going to apply the third heading using the ribbon. And the fourth. Now you notice that it had a heading one, heading two, then it automatically populated heading three. That's kind of a smart toolbar. Now I did a heading three and it populated heading four. This makes it nice and easy. Now, dealing with headings, I'm going to say this. If, if you're in a document, you know, potentially you might go down to four or five, maybe even six in a Word document because of the particular discipline you're dealing with. If you're in a web page, using, of course, the same idea because this is just a skill set. If you're going to use the same component in a web page, I would suggest that once you start hitting heading four, you might want to think whether or not that chunk actually applies to a new page. That way you have good, clear, concise structure and it could potentially be broken out and easier managed. Okay. So, with this process, heading one. Now, again, you don't like the way it looks. Okay, well that's fine. That doesn't matter. We can actually select and then, oh, I'm going to use a different color. 
Now let's do black in this case. I'm going to bold it and I'm going to use some other font, say Arial. So you still have your structure, which is ultimately important, and then you can change the way it looks. So they use this as style or they identify it as style. Actually, these are structural elements. The reason why we use headings is for structure. The way it looks is the style. Now, that might translate differently in the web environment in this. It could be that your style is controlled for you. If you're an ROCC developer, your style is controlled for you. We don't want you changing your style. We want consistent style. We just want you to apply the correct structure. So the style, you don't even have to worry about anymore. However, if you do have access, and in Word, you can change the way it looks and still have your structure. And the most important component of this is you have in structure. Now, why is that? We already talked about easy identification and cognitive application to it, easy for everybody. But also, an individual using an assistive technology can easier find the material in this. They actually have keyboard commands for a screen reader that then will let them know where the headers are in this document. Now, they might go through the document the first time they visit it to find out what all is in the document and read it all the way through once. Then, like us, they'll come back to the document and they'll go, well, I need to go to this particular topic under this particular header. And I remember that was a header two and it was, and so they'll bring up a headers list and they'll identify what that, and it's not gonna say heading, it'll be whatever the name of that particular heading is. And they'll find it and then they'll go directly to it just like we would visually. We would look at that, find it and start reading. They'll do the same thing. That's part of the reason why the structure is so very important, okay? Now, another thing about headings is we only want to use one heading one in your documents. Not any more than that. We're going to use heading twos as your navigation. And then three and four and maybe five in a Word document to then go underneath your heading twos. Now, you can use more than one heading one if you're writing chapters. So if you have a document that's actually a whole group of chapters, then there'd be a reason why you'd have more than one heading one. Does that make sense? And of course, then you're also gonna have a title for the page. All right, so any questions up to this point? It's pretty straightforward, right? Yes? So if this is a, a small document, say two or three pages, you would want, you just use heading one as, as the title rather than, the way, the way Word does titles, it makes it humongous. No, you don't want to use titles anyway. And that's, and that's the problem with titles, is titles don't render correctly. So what happens then is the person using an assistive technology has difficult getting access to that title. That would be more like on a cover page. Since you right. Know right. Okay. So. I was changing my mind on oh, <laughs> good. That's what I didn't want to do. So one, heading one, and then twos to navigate your main structure and then the rest of your headings underneath each one of those twos. Does that make sense? Okay. And you can change them. Yes? So for someone to actually go through and search these titles, you have to use that word and they can't search it if you just do it manually? No, doing manually is going to completely negate the structure. Yeah. And that's what people are used to doing is like using Word as a typewriter. And it's so much more efficient. You know what you can do with this? If you follow the structure, you could actually save your own template. Are you okay? Yes, I got distracted. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Ah. Okay, um, you can save these templates. In fact, I was crazy in my undergrad years. I was a double major and I was an honors English minor. And <laughs> one was APA, one was AP, and one was MLA. <coughs> So I had three styles to write to. Boy, was that fun. It's like, which style am I? Oh yeah, that's right, this one. Well, I finally came, and you could do this way back when. I finally broke down and created templates for the styles and then named it the style. 
So then I could bring up the style and then work from that direction. And you can do this. You can create a style that you like or a template that you like with the correct structure and the styling that you need and then save it as a template and name it. Now in this course, again, we have curated this so you can have these resources. Wrong one, I'm sorry. Down here at the bottom, it has templates and style basics and it talks about specifically how to handle this process. And it goes through some basic issues and how to change some of these pieces and save them as styles up front as well as on the back end. So all these are available to you as well. So the next thing we're going to talk about in dealing with structure is lists. What I want us to do is under subheading 2, I want us to create, I'm going to use two languages here. I want us, and I like the HTML language better because that's where I come from, but I think it's clearer. I'm going to use two languages. Under the first heading 2, I want us to do an ordered list or numbered. And under the second heading 2, I want us to do an unordered list or bulleted. Okay? So whatever you want to put in there, just go ahead and put it in. Uh, no. I'm just going to do three myself. It's actually pretty straightforward. How many of you have used the list tool on the ribbon? You have? Most of you. Excellent. Excellent. So it makes it nice and easy for you. Um, so of these two lists, we know that the first one's supposed to be an ordered or a numbered list, right? So how would I do that? I could have done it two ways. I could have gone in and just put an insertion point and then selected the numbered and then started doing it and it would create it for me. Or I could do it after the facts, which I have a tendency to do because as I said before, I am a stream of consciousness writer. So I usually do these things in that fashion and it actually provides me the ability to do that right there. This seems so easy, doesn't it? Really, literally, we are meeting standard by just using the tools available to us in Word or in the HTML editor. As long as we use those tools and we don't use keystrokes like dash, you know, I want to indent it so five spaces over or that type of thing. No, that completely eliminates any real structure and it makes it impossible to try to navigate the environment with an assistive technology. So just use the tools here. Now, there's a very important thing to consider. We talked about conciseness, chunking, Consistency is essential. So what I'm saying is this. What does an ordered or numbered list provide? Sequence. Yes. It's exact, that's what it's for. It's sequential. I wouldn't eat the pork before I bought it. Unless, you know, I wanted to get sick and get arrested at the same time. Um, or eat the pork necessarily before I cooked it, unless I'm just brave. <laughs> Some people might like raw pork. But my point being is this, is there is obviously a sequence that that represents. Red, green, blue. I could put blue in between red and green. It wouldn't change the meaning at all. Right? We want to be consistent on how we use our lists. We only want to use numbered or ordered lists for sequence, not for anything else. We want to use 
bulleted or unordered lists for materials that it doesn't matter what the sequence is. Now, in HTML land, they actually have a definition list that you can use if you need to actually identify definitions, but then that's, and it's not available in the WYSIWYG. Can you believe that? It ought to be. So, my point with this is, is we want to make sure we're consistent, and this is why. Cognitively, I will always know if I see a number that there is an order I have to follow. Always, nary a question, I will always know that. That means everybody has better access to that environment. Doesn't matter if I have a cognitive disability or anything else. Also, if I'm a person using a screen reader, I will come along and it will tell me about the list. It will tell me what type of list it is. And then I'll go through and be able to manage it that much quicker. Okay? So, it moves even further forward into providing that access door moment where everybody can independently come to this environment and acquire it no matter their ability. Good? Awesome. Pretty simple, huh? Amazingly enough, we're already meeting standard. Okay. Now, alternate text descriptions. This specifically is literally an alternate descriptive text for images and figures and such. Um, here is a really good video to talk about that. Um, I'll get into complex descriptions here in a little bit because there's two different types. First, we're going to do the simple description. And then we'll talk about complex as that applies. So what we want to do is go back to a word. Under subheading three, I'm going to insert, hopefully pictures are available. Yes. And I'm going to use the koala. just because I like koalas. Okay, everybody insert an image. Okay. So, it's a picture of a koala bear. And right now, I have no alternative text. In this instance, for simple alternative text, the only thing I'm concerned about is making sure the alternative text is there. It's different than a complex. And we'll talk about complex description here in a second. Here, this is a letter that I'm writing to one of my best friends, James Brown, who happens to be an individual who is blind. He has a different ability. His ability is he's an advanced screen reader user. But I also know his wife very well, too. That's the reason I didn't just describe what my escapades were like in Australia. I also wanted to share some graphics with his wife. So in this case, I'm going to do a simple alt text. All you need to do is collect on, or excuse me, right click on the image, go to format picture. It will actually open this format picture. You want to go over here, layout and properties, that third button over click on it, go to alt text, go to description, not title. All right. In description, then you want, in this case, it's a simple description. I'm going to put in there cute fuzzy koala bear. That's it. That's all I'm, because that's all I, you know, want him to know. Now, notice I didn't put picture of a cute fuzzy koala bear. Don't need to do that. Because what happens with a screen reader is it will come to that element and it will say graphic. And then cute fuzzy koala bear. 
It'll let them know that there's a graphic element there, and then it will give them the description. Now let's say if this was a flower and didn't have any meaning at all. It was just at the end of this one sentence, I wanted to put a decorative flower in there for whatever reason. Well, if you're going to do something that is decorative, then instead of putting a description, put an open quote, close quote. Literally, open quote, close quote. That basically acts as a null statement to where when the screen reader comes to this element, it will read in the, co the code the open close quote. And I'm showing the quotes. And what it will do is completely ignore this picture. The reason why you want to do that is if it's a decorative picture, they don't need to know about it. They don't want to know about it. If it's decorative only, what is it for? Now, there are some purists that might say, oh, but they need to know that there's a decorative flower there, whatever. Well, standard is, if it's a decorative element, this is what you do, okay? That's the best model to follow, so we're meeting. Okay, so that's all you need to do for a decorative graphic. Now, we were talking about decorative graphics, now we were talking about simple graphics, so something to think, can I borrow your water bottle for a second? Thank you. Do we have any more of these out there? Awesome. All right, um, if I was doing a simple alternative description. We, we want to try to keep them within 125, 155 characters, somewhere around there. Think about describing this. How would I describe this to someone I was on the phone with? Standard size water bottle with university logo on the left. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah, it's really simple. Could be water bottle, plastic, plastic water bottle, plastic water bottle with East Tennessee State University. I mean, very often the simple descriptions are really attuned to your personality and who you are. But it's, the idea is it's just very simple. Okay, I even had an individual start talking about plastic polymers and all that other good stuff here in engineering. And, but that's, that made sense. That's, and I'm sure the end user would have expected that from them too, because that's just how they communicate. Um, the point being is, okay, that's what we're going to do with simple alternative text. We want to make sure that we're providing alternative for this particular image. Now, if I was at, or excuse me, if I was in the Louvre, I mean Louvre, and I was coming up to that postage stamp picture, portrait, of that very famous portrait by Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> so, <laughs> Da Vinci, I'll be nice. Um, the wonderful Mona Lisa. In that case, then I would put portrait of the Mona Lisa. And I might want to put a little more description, maybe, or not, in the Louvre. Um, the point being is portrait actually applies. If I was in an Ansel Adams exhibit, then I might want to put photo of the Grand Canyon. So yes, it's going to say graphic photo of the Grand Canyon by Ansel Adams. Makes sense, right? So simple descriptions are simple. They aren't that difficult. There are a couple of rules to keep in mind. And then decorative is pretty easy to manage too. Now, the other component to this is the not so simple. All right, I have this wonderful koala bear picture. 
and I happen to be in zoology class. Am I going to use a simple alternative text description for this? Probably not. It's probably going to have a lot more meaning than cute fuzzy koala bear. Unless, you know, I can get away with assessing someone and saying that's a cute fuzzy koala bear. <laughs> I don't think so. Potentially then, what you want to do is create a simple alternative text description that identifies the object that you are then going to describe in the body of the text. So it could be that this is a particular type of marsupio. We go ahead and we identify this particular type of marsupio in the alt text. So then the person coming to it, and you can caption it too if you want to, the person coming to it will hear, using a screen reader, whatever that particular identifier is. Then in the body of the text, following this graphic, you would then describe specifically what it is you're wanting that student to get out of that graphic representation. Now, that is very, very important. So the way to look at this is we aren't describing this as a picture means a thousand words. We're applying the description of what it is we want to assess the student on. This is what I expect you to get out of this graphic in context to the curriculum they're reading around it. So that means, for instance, while I was in AU, we started an alternative media center. And along the way, we decided, well, we were doing transcripts already, and specifically we're doing it for our distance ed program, as well as our disability resources. That's great. They decided, well, look, go ahead and start doing description, couldn't you? Sure, why not? Because we didn't know any better. Seriously. So, what happened was, there was a particular text. This was in theater. Two different courses using the same textbook, unlike what we're doing. And in that process, using the same graphics that they were putting online. Well, we decided, okay, Here's this picture of the Shakespearean stage, and it has particular actors in particular positions, dressed in fashion, and then you had the stage set up in all its design. And what we did, because they just handed us the stuff, and the two courses, one was for set and design, and one was for acting. What we did was describe the picture in a thousand words. We just described what we saw. Well, when the two SMEs, subject matter experts, faculty that were teaching the courses, read the descriptions, they were like, uh, excuse me, what does this mean? Now, some of it that was in there, oh, the, you know, we did describe some of the set designs effectively, as, as in we described the design, but that was it. It had nothing to do with what they wanted the students to get out of that graphic in that description. In the acting course, they wanted positioning of actors on stage, why they were entering from one side, etc. In the set and design, it was literally about the set and design and lighting and all of that good stuff. So entirely different assessment descriptions. So keep this in mind, when you're dealing with complex graphics, you identify the object and how it applies to the description that follows. Now what that gives you is not only a wonderful description, and this happens in the classroom as well, it not only gives you a wonderful description that more people can take advantage of, not just that person with a visual impairment, using an assistive technology. Everybody benefits from that. But then that individual, if you want to then ask that individual to identify, for instance, out of that description in a quiz or testing instance, then they can go back and understand what the reference was that goes to that description. Or you could use the identifier for that graphic in that quiz element and ask them to put a part of that description. So basically, it's still the learning space, and then you can replicate it in the testing space if you need to. There's two ways to handle this process, and it really makes it easy, except in STEM. 
and I'm going to say steam. Art is just as difficult to describe and sometimes more so than dealing with STEM. Math has gotten a little easier if all you're dealing with is equations, not the charts and graphs that come along with that, but the equations. We have a language for that. It's called MathML. So luckily enough, that's good. And if you're putting information on the web using equations, actually in D2L, it has an equation editor that inserts MathML for you. So you can go through and go ahead and create your equations using its editor and then choose to insert it as MathML. It'll still display like you've created it, but the difference is it has the MathML code behind it so then a person using a screen reader can get access to it. So you have a leg up. There's ChemML coming, so those chemistry individuals will soon at least have components of their discipline language available to them in a markup language. Now, biology, <laughs> zoology, art appreciation, yeah, that's a different concept. Now we're dealing with descriptions. Now the other component in dealing with description and complex graphics is to think of it like this. If I was in the classroom and I was working with an individual who was blind in my class and I'm using a visual aid, and this is the way you need to think about it when you're actually reviewing materials. If I'm using a visual aid, I would need to describe how that visual aid applies to the curriculum and how I'm using it in that course. Same thing. You're applying the assessment components of that visual aid and how that's working in that curriculum and why you're using it. Now in that process, then not only are you going to then benefit that individual who is blind so they understand what it is that you're doing, but then you're going to benefit everybody because it's rather amazing how many people actually benefit from that extra description of these elements. Very often unwilling to ask questions about it and consistently we have seen more and more instances when this is happening where you have the entire class showing a benefit because the average goes up a little bit. So keep that in mind. When you're dealing with descriptions, you want to assess and complex, I'm saying. You want to describe what you want the student to know out of that graphic and identify the graphic in the alt text. Any questions on that? Yes, sir. In the complex, it would be the description in the body itself. So the text will be in the body. For the alt text identification, if you want to provide that identification to everybody else, you could caption it if you'd like. Or don't worry about it because they're going to identify it because it's a graphic and you're going to be describing that graphic anyway. Does that make sense? The reason why you're using the alt text that nobody else sees is specifically for that individual using an assistive technology to get access to it. Okay. Okay? Yes, sir. Okay, it's driving me crazy. What do we use title? That's up to you. I, I, title is not necessary to, to meet code. Okay. Um, if you use title, make sure it isn't the same thing you're using in the description. Okay? That's up to you. But I personally, I never do. I let the graphic stand for itself or if anything, I might capture, but that's it. Um, the thing you have to do is put your description in description because that's where it puts the, in the code so the screen reader will come to it, it will parse it and see that's where the alt text is. Does that make sense? Okay, good. So while that's good, if you have any questions on complex descriptions, the helpful resources, the last module, has a whole bunch of resources dealing with this very issue, specifically with STEM, and a bunch of ways to address this process and resources out there for you. So, because I know how difficult, and guess what? 
So do a whole lot of other people. <laughs> They've been working on this for a long time. No, <laughs> we wish. <laughs> but there are a bunch of resources out there that, that will provide you access and you can email them too. And they even have objects, so that's something to look into. All right. So that was dealing with alternate text. Now let's talk about hyperlinks. So hyperlinks are pretty straightforward. Again, we have the directions in this and we have some references. But specifically, I'm going to do an easy hyperlink. And the thing to think about hyperlinks, well, let me first ask a question. How many of you actually put the address as a hyperlink? Hallelujah. I'm stuck. Well, do you? Ooh, not good. Yeah, no. We, we don't want to put the address as the hyperlink, at least not the first. In other words, if you have it in line, even standing alone, you want to have the hyperlink be standalone descriptive. It tells you where it's going. For classes on so-and-so, go to the, with quotes, course catalog course catalog is the description, right? Or in this case, go ahead and create a hyperlink of whatever your graphic is. I'm going to actually make the entire portion a link. I could just put koala bears, and then I'd find out I'm going to wiki, right? And it stands alone, it's koala bears. But I want to identify a little more for the link. So that way, this is what happens, and, and this is why it's so important that it's standalone descriptive. Is an individual using a screen reader will come to that link, and it will identify it as a link. So they'll read it and they'll know it's a link the first time through. The second time through, just like we would visually see the link that we need to go to immediately, just like headings, they would pull up a list and it would have a list of links. And in this case, the reason why I did it this way is it would say wiki reference for koala bears. So I know it's a wiki reference and it's for koala bears. And of course, it's a link because it's in my links list. So you can imagine how difficult that is if it was the address. And let alone a Java address because you have a hotspot. Then that becomes a nightmare. So the thing to keep in mind is to make sure that standalone is descriptive. So in other words, we don't do click here. We don't do read more. None of that stuff. Because then you pull up a links list, let alone hearing it in the page, and it's a bunch of click here's and read mores. What does that tell me? Nothing at all, except for it's a bunch of click here's and read mores. And then I have to go to it to find out what it was. And if I have like, unfortunately, some landing pages of institutions put a lot of read mores, and I have five or six or seven read mores in my list, and I don't know which one of those I need to go to. So make sure that it is descriptive of what it is indicating and where it's going. It's that simple. So in this case, what I'm going to do is right click. I'm going to go to hyperlink. Of course, you could go to insert and click hyperlink that way too. There's a couple different ways. We have the instructions for Mac in here too. I already have my text to display and then, oh my goodness. Oh my, what is this gonna take forever? Thank you. Now note I'm using Internet Explorer for this or Internet Exploder, depending on. <laughs> but the one thing that I can say about Internet Explorer is when you do this, you do a Control-C, you go back, 
it automatically populates. You don't have to go in there and do a control V. You don't have to paste it in there. So that's pretty cool. And that's really about the only time I use Internet Explorer because I like Chrome. But anyway, um, so that's pretty much it. That's it. I click OK and it's going to make the link active. And I'm done. I don't have to worry about it. Unless, this is in a Word environment, right? So I'm clicking OK and we're in a Word environment. I'm going to go ahead and there's my active link. So I know I'm in Word. I know I have a link in Word. I know that it's not going to open the link in Word. Where is it going? It's going to go to a browser. So knowing that I'm in one of these document types, Word, Excel, etc., I know that I don't have to let anybody know this is going somewhere else that is opening a new window. Best practice. This is not conformance. This is best practice. If you are going to open a new window and you're in the HTML environment, say D2L, then you really should let the person know that a new window is opening. What you would do would be in the link text, put a left parent opens a new window, right parent. So that way this, the person knows, and when they pull up the links list as well, they know that it's opening a new window also. Now, the difference is this. Some screen readers, that's why this is best practices, some screen readers will now let you know that a new window has opened because so many people have not let you know that a new window is opening, right? So the screen readers have scripted specifically job access with speech as well as voiceover for Mac will let you know a new element has opened or a new window has opened. So you don't have to worry about that population. The problem is NVDA does not at this time. Hopefully the new beta version, they're going to be actually implementing that script. Now, if you want to play with a screen reader, write this down. It's N as in Nancy, V as in Victor, N, V, D as in dog, A as in Apple, N, V, D, A. That is an open source, free screen reader. That is very powerful, not JAWS, but it's a free version that is taking over a large portion of the market space. Why? Because it's free. And a whole lot of individuals out there who need a screen reader can't afford the thousand dollars it costs to get job access with speech, which is the most advanced screen reader that you can script to and do all sorts of amazing stuff with. But NVDA is an excellent tool if you just want to play with one to see how it works. All right. Now that tool, yeah, you do need to notify, let that person know, okay, this is opening. Now the question is, why would I open a new window if I'm in HTML? Why would I open a new window instead of having it open in the same window I'm in? I mean, the traditional dealing, I mean, now it's all new tabs because that's how browsers have been defaulted, which I was kind of aggravated with that because now I've got to go between the tabs. It's like, well, using my technology to go between the tabs isn't easy. Using my vision going between tabs is really easy. So I'm going to default my browser to the way it used to be where it would open in the same window. To where now, I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but when it opens in the same window and I hit backspace, it takes me back to the previous window of where I was at. Everybody remember that? That's nice. I don't even have to worry. I love that just because it takes me back to the last link I was on. As a JAWS user or a screen reader user, I would default my browser to do that for me so I don't have to deal with navigating to the new tab in a couple extra keystrokes, right? This is gonna make it nice and easy for me. I can go back and forth. Now what that means for us in dealing with D2L or HTML 
is we need to have that object, and specifically in D2L's WYSIWYG, open in the whole window, not the same frame. It defaults to the same frame. What happens with the same frame is then it opens that particular window in that iframe, and then you have all the navigation in the iframe, and then unfortunately when it refreshes the page because it went ahead and opened it in the iframe, then the screen reader user gets to navigate through the entire page again to get back to that iframe to then begin using that product. The bottom line is if we can avoid that and you don't mind opening a whole window, that's fine. It depends on how you're using the material. Now notice I have said nothing about opening a new window yet. Rule of thumb, if opening a new window, the reason why you would do that is specific to resource. You're dealing with curriculum material, and in the process of dealing with this curriculum material, you have provided a resource while dealing with material that you want them to use right then. So then it opens in a new window, and they can go back and forth between the curriculum material and the resource. This happens in STEM a lot. So that makes sense. That's why you would open a new window. You wouldn't just open a new window offhand. Does that make sense? Okay, that's it. Any questions about that? No? All right, we're moving on.